I tend to get a bit wound up by uh, the ills, as I see it, that uh, beset our bread system. And in thinking about the issue of mindfulness in relation to, to bread and food in general, I began to wonder what I might mean by that term. I obviously have a good example in Julia's book on that very subject. But as I thought more about it, I became extraordinarily optimistic, really, and thankful that I'm alive at this particular moment, which is always a nice place to be, rather than regretful that we didn't live in some previous period or maybe some future period. Um, and I say that because we're lucky enough to be able to examine the wisdom of the ages as passed down in things like our understanding of bread and particularly of the fermentative processes which lie at the heart of good bread, uh, we're able to correlate those with modern molecular science and understand how extraordinarily clever and insightful and observant our forebears were, the forebears that for the last 10 or 15,000 years have been making something that we might recognize as bread out of wheat and similar cereals, because in general, the way they did it and continue to do it in, in parts of the world that haven't been beset by the disease of uh, Anglo-American imperialism, which has colonized the world, not just with its, its markets and its money, but also with its white flour, a curious kind of uh, uh, pall over many cultures which has distorted the way they feed themselves in disastrous ways as we are discovering ourselves at this very time with the growth of non-communicable diseases, so-called, which are really diseases brought about by uh, in inappropriate diet. And that includes a diet of foods grown in inappropriate soils. So when I'm talking and thinking about mindfulness in relation to baking, it immediately seems to throw up a whole lot of different things, each of which is connected one to the other. And I'm going to try and set, that, set out my thinking in broadly in three categories, in, in terms of the, the culture that lies at the heart of our understanding of bread, the more specific nutritional issues which have been affected by changes in the way that we make our bread over the last couple of hundred years, but more seriously over the last 50 years. And then in terms of those, those broader societal relationships, particularly the power relationships, the political ones, which have always defined the kind of bread that any particular individual eats, um, but which we tend to forget now because those who pull the strings in our society are extraordinarily clever in not appearing to do so, but in kidding us that it's actually we that are making the choices that affect our lives and that we have unparalleled choices in the food that we eat these days um, and that we should be very thank you, th thankful um, and not complain at all. Now I want us actually to understand mindfulness as of course involving care and attention in a very obvious way looking at what we're doing and understanding it and caring about the important issues with which we're dealing when we're making our bread or growing our food or whatever it may be. But for me there's an element beyond that which makes a point out of mindlessness, gives it, mindfulness, gives it a point, and that is the, how we relate to the possibilities that we draw from what we observe when we're being mindful. In other words, the opportunities for change that are inherent in any system. Because it doesn't take much observation of bread making to, to see that it's a system which, is, which has transformation and change in its very DNA. When we take flour and water and make them into bread with some form of leavening or yeast, we are changing those raw materials from one state to another. And it's the nature, the particular detailed nature of that transformative process, which is so fascinating to people 
once they get into bread making, but which also is an extraordinarily powerful example of right relationships, I would say, which we can use as a metaphor and, a, and as a guide to doing things better at multiple levels, not just in terms of the nutrients in our bread, but in terms of our relationships one with another, and also with the natural world from which the raw materials, of course, originate. And in that sense, I think I see mindfulness as being the kind of mental attitude, if you like, that we can bring to the process of asserting the, the need for, for fairness and justice in our relationships at a political and social level, but also actually in our understanding of what we're doing when we're working alongside other agents in a system uh, such as bread making, where it's clear, some of you have heard me say this already today, it's clear that we are not the only important agents in the system, although we tend to behave as though we are. So when making bread, it's all too easy for us to think that we decide what ingredients to go into it, we put them in the mixing bowl, we switch the mixer on, we take it out of the mixer when it's achieved a certain consistency, we put it in a tin, we let it rise, we turn the oven on and so on, and it's just us that are making those decisions and achieving those changes. But that's an incredibly short-sighted view of what happens when you make bread, because of course uh, we actually are completely dependent on the reliable and repeatable performance of those yeasts and beneficial bacteria that operate in properly fermented bread. And it's about change, transformation and appropriate interdependence, if you like, that seems to me to lie at the heart of our cultural understanding of what bread does. Clearly, for most people, for most of their, most of history, bread has been the, the obvious thing that you have to have on the table to keep body and soul together. You need food, and food was equated in our sort of society with a plentiful supply of bread. Um, it might have been rice or similar grains in other societies, but for us it was it was bread made from wheat or barley or rye. And if there was enough of it, you had a chance of having a full belly and feeling satisfied. And if there wasn't enough, you were anxious. Um, and in some cases, of course, motivated to change your situation, to rise up and exp and ask yourself, with other people, what was going wrong in your society that there was not enough bread or you didn't have a necessary control over your bread, your bread supply. You were dependent entirely on somebody else making it available to you, which they did not do all that reliably. Sometimes for pure reasons of power and sometimes because uh, the environment and harvest didn't yield you a reliable supply. Uh, one of the most striking little uh, references or I suppose passwords that you might uh, glean from a wonderful book called 6,000 Years of Bread by a man called H.E. Uh, Jacob which was published in the 1940s um, really brought home to me the sense in which we've, we've very often as, a, um, as people been uh, completely at um, sort of lost in terms of our relationship to the means of subsistence. We've depended so much on somebody else allowing us the right to, to have enough, if you like, that this has determined very much of our consciousness about um, what we regard as good bread or uh, an adequate supply or a right price or a suitable quality and that kind of thing. And uh, this writer points to the fact that in the 14th century in both France and Britain, there were revolts of the peasants. Um, if you were educated at the same time as me, you'd have known that the peasants' revolt took place in, I think, 1381, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, it was one of those dates in history that we all had to learn. I had no idea what the peasants were revolting about. But it turns out that in France, it was very obvious what they were revolting about because they had a kind of password that they used between themselves 
to know whether somebody was on their side or not. And that password was le pain se lève, the bread is rising. Actually, the bread is rising itself, more correctly. In other words, something is fermenting there, and what they meant is, you know, we are rising up to do something about our plight, which was that the lords of the manor, the people who controlled the land, did not allow the peasants to eat their own grain. They had to grow it, harvest it, thresh it, and then deliver it to the landowner. And if they were lucky, they got some of it back, milled through the mill that was also controlled by the lord of the manor. And so at each stage, the, the landowner acted as the person who was extracting value from the process of getting a bounty from the soil of wheat. And he was taking a little bit off for the milling and a little bit off for transferring it from the mill to the, to the peasants, who could have actually simply harvested the grain and kept it themselves had they had any rights at all over the land that they were farming. And there are such close parallels between the powerlessness uh, of people affected by the land grabs and the neo-colonial activities going on in both Africa and Asia now by large corporations, agricultural and biotechnological, in their ostensible search to increase agricultural production, but actually, of course, to control the type of agricultural production that goes on. But there's also a parallel between our plight as consumers of bread in a modern Western society where we think we go to the shop and have a big choice of what to eat. But actually, when you look a little bit closer underneath it, you see that that choice is really very limited. It's limited from the moment that the, the grain sprouts in the ground and grows right through to the, to the point at which it is turned from grain into flour and flour into bread and even at the point at which it goes from the bakery, wherever that may be, to the point of sale where we can gratefully exchange some money for it and take it home to eat. At every stage, there are a, small, a relatively small number of interests who are taking value, extracting value, quality, if you like, from that, in a way that leaves us with rather a denuded product. And I mean specifically by that, that the the nature of the grains that have been grown in the last, developed and grown in the last 50 years, has changed uh, quite significantly from the grains that were developed and selected by farmers over the previous hundreds of generations, really. A, a radical change took place when the Green Revolution succeeded in splicing together two, two types of grain, one with a um, a short, a very short straw, which originated in Japan. Nothing wrong with that per se, um, but it was spliced together with grains from uh, other parts of the world, particularly um, traditional grains from Mexico. And the two together produced these hybrid grains, which had the, the characteristic of having much young, heavier yields than previous varieties, but, but only if they were fed with a considerable number of different agrochemicals, first of, all, first of all fertilizers to make them grow bigger and heavier grains, but also all the plant protection products which were needed to, to, to keep them going because they tended uh, to be rather more vulnerable to natural um, diseases and pests. And so the whole system was realigned to uh, produce greater yields of a certain type of grain, which it turned out, as time went on, it became clear that some of the genetics of those grains had, had changed. And two aspects of them have really become clear only in the last 10 or 15 years. One is that the nutrient density of those grains has been hollowed out. We, now know, we, can, we can measure the amount of um, minerals, particularly, and to some extent vitamins as well, which exist in modern hybrid grains. And by some calculations, they are 30 to 40 percent less dense in those minerals than grains, even relatively modern varieties that were grown 30 or 40 years ago. So there seems to be less in them 
less in them of the things that we value our grain for, which is not just protein and starch, but it's actually a complex of important minerals. And the other aspect is that some of the, the actual proteins which form that um, substance in, in wheat particularly, which accounts for its, its functional quality in its ability to make a very light loaf, which is one of the things that's so attractive about wheat and makes it more accessible to more people than perhaps rye or barley, which tend to be produced denser loaves. The protein structure which um, supports that, and we've been talking about that today, the gluten which comes about as a result of the, uh, the, the proteins in grain coming into contact with water and then forming this substance. Those very proteins have actually changed and the nature of the change is, is still quite disputed because it seems to be something to do with what is now being called gene expression rather than a fundamental change of, um, of, of, of the genetics of the wheat plant. So the DNA looks very similar to uh, wheat has always looked, but the expression of certain particular fractions of protein has changed as you would expect it to change if it's been hybridized very aggressively to improve yield and also bread making quality as understood by industrial bakers. And it turns out that some of these um, strange changes in, in the protein are associated with the increase in intolerance to wheat and uh, the specific autoimmune disease called celiac disease. So, Celiac disease, which was only characterized in the 1950s, and you do feel that if it had been as serious a condition as it obviously is for some people, it would have been noticed long before the 1950s if there had been much of it about. That disease has grown in incidence now and is generally thought to affect around about 1% of the population, but even the authorities who conservatively estimate that tell us that there's a great deal of under-reporting of celiac disease. And if that wasn't bad enough, this, incidentally in case you're not aware, this disease of celiac, um, celiac sprue as it's called, has only one remedy at the moment, one treatment, which is to desist from eating anything with gluten in it for the rest of your life, which is not a great diagnosis, um, particularly for people who really like wheat bread. So, that's bad enough, but the condition of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which when people like me kind of alluded to the possibility that it might exist even as little as eight years ago when I published Bread Matters, um, we, were, we were ridiculed and criticized by people for suggesting such a thing. This is now um, widely discussed in the academic literature, although few people can agree on exactly what it is but they know that something is going on which is related to the consumption of things which contain gluten, and that is mostly wheat. Rye and barley have a kind of protein in it which is similar in its effect to wheat gluten, but it's not the same. And it's extraordinary to me that nobody has made the, drawn the obvious conclusion from this, that it could be that there's something about the way we make our bread, not just the grains we grow it from, but the way we make our bread that may have changed in the last 30 or 40 years, which might account for some of the growth in this inability, it seems, to digest proteins which human beings have, broadly speaking, been quite happily ingesting and thriving on. Indeed, thriving on when it's been a much, much bigger proportion of our diet than it is now for thousands of years. So something is going on there, and it seems almost willful that very few people have been looking at our bread-making method as a possible place to start understanding why changes in the genetics of the grain might also have been accompanied by something else that we've done wrong to make our bread so relatively indigestible. And when I started looking into this, not because I had some great idea, but because so many people were coming to me and saying, I don't know what it is, Andrew, but I can eat your bread, but I can't eat bread that I buy in an ordinary shop. What, can you explain what the difference is? And I, I said, well, mine's made of 
sourdough or I mean it usually was that that was the bread that seemed to be most digestible but I had no real explanation as to why sourdough should be more easy to digest than any other bread and in looking into it I realized that there wasn't a great deal of research out there but what there was clearly pointed to the fact that something in the process of fermentation particularly in the presence of sourdough was responsible for a transformation of the raw materials which is necessary to make them go down well if you like in in terms of human digestion but here's the thing we don't actually measure this as a society we do an awful lot of measuring and testing and research into all kinds of things but there's a there's an almost total absence in relating the the issue of whether or not our food is digestible or indeed full of nutrients uh, which seems to me to be, um, at the very least, a, a dereliction of duty on the part of our scientists. And I've said this before, and forgive me if you've heard me say it, but it does seem really very odd that if you're a UK farmer and you, want to, you decide that you want to grow a crop of grain for human consumption, you go to a, a thing called the National List, published by the Homegrown Cereals Authority, and there you will see all the latest varieties of grain that have been developed by the plant breeding institutes in this country and abroad. And they are scored according to certain criteria. And there's the columns which, which give you the comparison with the control, which is always 100. And so you can see that such and such a variety has got 102.2 of um, the yield of the control variety. Yield, of course, is always in column number one. And then there's a series of other attributes that grains are scored for, which include things like bread making quality, the protein level, for instance, typical protein level, um, the thousand grain weight, in other words, how much uh, fill there is in each grain. Um, straw length is a very important one because if you're a chemical farmer, you don't want um, a long straw because it's more likely to fall over, even if you spray it within an inch of its life with hormone straw stiffeners, traces of which can now be found in the urine of almost every European citizen, incidentally. Um, just to give you an idea of how infected we are by this, uh, what I would regard as dubious agricultural practice of supporting our prime agricultural crops with chemicals that, that uh, get everywhere in our environment and are perhaps not contributing towards our national health. Um, and as you proceed down the columns of, of scoring, you can make a decision as to whether in your conditions, your soil type, your, your area of the country, um, this or that variety might be suitable. And so you make your decision. And if you're a, a farmer who also grows varieties of grain for feeding animals, which of course many do, you'll notice that there's a line drawn under the bread making varieties and then they start scoring the feed varieties as they're called and so they have different names and they're scored for this or that criterion usually uh, yield is first place as well but rather curiously a couple of extra columns appear at the right hand side and one of them is headed nutrient density and the other one is called digestibility and we study those with great interest and acuity when we are breeding our grains for animal consumption we don't even measure them when we're breeding our grains for human consumption now a visitor from another planet might regard that as rather an odd state of affairs and i think that it's a, a shame on all our scientists and all our public policy makers that we sit there and we look at this system and we have nothing to say about it nobody says how crazy is that we've got half the country desisting from eating grain or saying that they feel uneasy, unwell, not terribly happy about eating the everyday bread that's made by our big bakers. And yet we don't have anything to say about digestibility of our, of our grains or our food in general. Um, one or two people do, of course. The gastroenterological community are quite interested in digestibility. But even they are very reluctant to ask questions about whether processing method of common foods like breads particularly have changed in any way that might make it less likely for people to be able to digest those foods. <laughs>
Now, one or two people have begun to look at this, and certainly the pr preliminary evidence does suggest that when we do what we have done in this country and in others to shorten radically the time that we take to ferment our breads, and I'm leaving aside completely the issue of the additives that we put into it as well, which is a whole other subject which, which would require uh, another talk. And indeed, a very good book has just been published by Joanna Blythman called Swallow This, which really enumerates all the additives that go into our food. It's a bit of a horror story, I, I can tell you. And in fact, the front cover is rather, rather grim and gruesome. It's like a sort of skull shaped, like the skull on, on poisons, you know, that, that rather nasty sort of thing. But it's made out of a, a slice of obviously white industrial bread, slightly toasted, um, meant to suggest that many of these additives are in fact in our daily bread, which sadly they are. Anyway, the, um, the point is that even without any consideration of the additives, the key change that we've made in our bread in the last 40 years, 50 years, is to reduce fermentation down to virtually no time at all. And this, of course, is good for business in the sense that it means we can get more bread through our bakeries in a quicker time. But the consequences are now just beginning to be understood. Because it's only when you transform the bread slowly with, with appropriate fermentation that you can change the proteins and, to some extent, the starches as well, and create the conditions in the baked bread that will, in turn, pass on an appropriate molecular structure and uh, population of bacteria or bacterial residues, which will actually enable our, gu our guts to function properly, which is kind of a common way of calling, calling uh, describing digestibility. There's a lot of interest now in bacteria in the gut and, and all that kind of thing. Um, it's only a matter of time before people wake up to the fact that whatever else we've been doing to our bread in the last 40 years, we've been seriously hampering the ability of bacteria to modify it, to get anywhere near it, in fact, really, um, and thus to transform it in a way that makes it easy for our bodies to get any goodness out of, but also to digest without discomfort. So when, I, when I'm thinking about changes that have taken place in, bre in bread, and I'm, I'm looking at, uh, at the changes in grain and the changes in nutrition, I'm also um, inevitably drawn to, to ask, well, why is it that we seem so stuck that even when these little bits of scientific information, of medical research, and, of course, the enormous, what one might call, data set that's out there, which is all the people who've decided not to eat very much bread in the last 10 or 20 years who seek out gluten-free products, not because they're celiacs, but because they find that actually changing their diet from eat, eating ordinary shop bread makes them feel better. You know, why is it that this um, has not really been acted on? And I think the answer is that our bread system like our food system in general, uh, is, is locked up, is controlled by a very small number of interests who have very little incentive to change at the moment. Although, since they're presiding over what has all the hallmarks of a completely unsustainable system at many levels, you do wonder whether in the background some changes are being planned, uh, which they may choose to reveal at a moment when they can maximize their the profitability of such changes. One of the striking things about uh, the food industry is that it never looks quite so impregnable as when it's just about to, to make a major change in something that it does. But it never apologizes for the years in which uh, it's been selling us something that is perhaps not quite what it seemed to be. In the red sphere, one of the most classic examples is um, the additives that were used in bread making. I started making bread for a living in 1976 and I never used any additives because I didn't really know what they were and I certainly had no desire to eat anything that wasn't food. But when I began to read about it I found that I could have been using a substance called potassium bromate and another one called azodicarbonamide uh, among the other um, chemical improvers and emulsifiers 
colorants, flavorings, preservatives, and so on, that routinely went into compound bread improvers. And when I, in my very amateurish way, raised questions as to whether these things were okay to put in bread, um, I, was, I was routinely patted on the head, as it were, and told not to worry because the scientists knew they were perfectly safe. They've all been tested, and they're perfectly safe. Well, those two particular chemicals are not used in bread anymore. They are banned in this country because, guess what, they're carcinogens. So for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, the British public was being fed systematically carcinogens, which our scientists had assured us were perfectly safe to eat. Now, I'm not accusing anybody of having deliberately made a, a mistake of that short sort, but it does make you wonder just how um, reliable the testing regimes are and the advice that comes from scientists who very often are working with dossiers of information provided by the very people who want to sell the product in question. And I think there's a serious question over the independence of science and its ability to be honest about um, what it finds, and particularly about the publication of research which shows results which don't go along with the uh, particular point that the commissioner of that research wants to make. And the medical profession is well aware of this phenomenon in the case of pharmaceutical products, where drugs will be tested and any negative test research will be kind of sat on and not revealed. Um, and so it appears as though all the tests that have been done, all the research uh, is positive uh, or at the very minimum neutral. And I think that we as consumers of bread have every right to take a leaf out of our 14th century cousins and to say it's about time that something that we collectively rose up and did something about this because every aspect of our system is controlled by people who have no ultimate interest in the health of the consumers of bread or indeed of the sustainable health of the environment in which they operate because everything they do is is pushing in the wrong direction which I take to be a, a measure of its unsustainability. Now you may think these are rather exaggerated claims but when you actually look at the way in which we do our bread you can see how this this um, really is pretty incontrovertible. Our grains are grown with the interests of um, farmers in mind, but also of large bakers. Nobody ever asks consumers whether they want their grain to be um, tastier or uh, indeed fuller of nutrients. So we aren't asked at the plant breeding stage what we would like our farmers to be doing. And the grain that farmers grow typically is sent to large mills where it's aggregated with other people's grains. If indeed it ever reaches um, uh, a baker to make into bread, because a lot of grain is grown for other purposes, either animal feed or starch production, or distilling into alcohol, or uh, nowadays making into biodiesel. Uh, and so even the wheat farmer that we might have been expecting to grow our food for us is actually often engaged in something very difficult, different. Having gone to the large mill, it then is stripped of much of its nutrient uh, complex by refining through roller milling, which even when uh, the result is reassembled as wholemeal flour, doesn't actually contain 100% of what it started out as, and may well not have the germ of the grain uh, which has the unfortunate habit of going rancid fairly quickly, uh, put back in it. And so, and particularly since the germ of the grain contains vitamin E, which can be sold quite profitably to um, other nutraceutical and pharmaceutical industries, and then sold back to us at many times the price that we might have paid for it if we'd just eaten the flour as wholemeal in the first place. Uh, stone ground wholemeal, that would be. So there is, as you can see, a tendency here for people to profit at each stage by dividing our, our food up, by reducing it, maybe recombining it in ways that have some sort of uh, arguable health claim, but essentially um, are not quite the sum of the parts, um, or certainly not the whole. And then when it gets to the, the large uh, combine bakers, the plant bakers so-called, the fermentation method, is so fast, as I've said, that it doesn't really 
deal with some of the problematic issues of the, of the grains. It doesn't bring out the best in them and it doesn't, it doesn't counteract some of the, the things in grain which have always been there, but which we traditionally, with our slow fermentation methods that we've been practicing for so many centuries uh, or millennia, actually um, make our bread digestible to almost everybody because that's just the way it is. And so, by the time we actually get this loaf of bread on the shelves of a supermarket shop, not only has it travelled an enormous distance at considerable uh, cost of emissions and energy use in the system, but it has no sen real sense of connection between us and the, the plants that were growing as wheat plants in the soil or the person who is the custodian of that process, i.e. the farmer. And that lack of connection is fatal, it seems to me, in the transmission of health, which should be the obligation of everyone who practices agriculture. Because what are they doing if they aren't actually trying to take the, the available health from the soil and the sun and pass it on to their fellow citizens in the form of foodstuffs that they can enjoy and be healthy in eating? So if I could just explain how I have a different vision of this, which I'm trying to encourage other people to share in relation to the place that I live in, which is Scotland. And this is not for nationalistic purposes. Um, it's simply that Scotland is a, a discrete administrative unit, and it has a tradition of um, both plant breeding, uh, breeding its gra own grains, and of local self-sufficiency in grains, which hasn't been fully realized in probably two or three hundred years. In fact, one of the striking things about the independence referendum last year, in all the campaigning that surrounded it, was the complete lack of recognition of how Scotland was, um, by um, a narrow majority, that a, a significant minority of people in Scotland were, were wanting a much greater degree of independence in, their, in the control of their affairs, while having almost zero control over their fundamental bread supply, because almost all the bread flour that's used to make bread in Scotland is imported from another country, i.e. England, and in fact from further afield as well. And if you aren't at all in control, if you have no sovereignty over your bread, to what extent can you describe yourself as being independent? And if you ev even did have administrative independent and you still had to recognize that most of the bread eaten in the highlands of Scotland is baked in Liverpool, that would be a rather strange situation, it seems to me. And it wasn't always like that. Scottish plant breeders working in the 19th century were renowned, and many of the varieties that were grown not far from where I now live have traveled around the world and uh, I've begun with one or two other people to try and repatriate some of these varieties. Uh, most movingly, I found some grown by a man called Patrick Sheriff in East Lothian, about 25 miles from where I live, um, sitting in the gene bank in St. Petersburg in the Vavilov Institute. And that's not just a kind of um, curiosity of international seed sharing, it actually represents an extraordinary um, homecoming of those seeds because they are only there because Nikolai Vavilov himself traveled to Britain in the late 1920s and early 30s. And as he always did, he gathered as many seed varieties as he could. He went to lots of other parts of the world, Latin America, North America, Asia, and so on. And before Stalin incarcerated and effectively murdered him, uh, he had amassed this extraordinary collection of plant material and had defined the centers of diversity where the, the, the key food crops that we depend on as a species had been domesticated and sort of thrived um, and had kind of <coughs> lodged examples of these in the gene bank in St. Petersburg for the benefit of humanity in the future, a mission which extraordinarily survived not just the cynicism of Stalinist control and repression, but actually survived the Nazi blockade 
which lasted for 842 days. And the curators of those seeds died, in some cases, of starvation sitting at their desks rather than eating the seeds which they could well have simply consumed because they were hungry and starving. And for me, when I had a little packet of seeds which were lodged in that bank in, the, in 1928 and 1930 in my hand, and which hadn't just sat there, um, they had been grown out, including growing out during those two years of the blockade, when they had to grow the crops uh, under armed guard to stop the population of St. Petersburg, that was well, Leningrad, from starving. Um, so those crops had been grown out and then replaced in the gene bank. And they, a little parcel of them came to me, two or three different varieties with these Scottish names on them. And I felt something quite extraordinarily powerful was going on there in terms of the transmission by one generation to another of something of permanence, of, if you like, of potential, which, when put in the ground and looked after with the necessary stewardship by me or other people, would yield a bounty in terms of healthfulness, which I take to be the mission of anyone who is, who is trying to make, grow, and prepare food for other people. So, Scotland the Bread is an attempt to rebuild the Scottish grain economy on the principles of equity, of health, and of local control. Not local control for the sake of a nationalist agenda. Um, local control in the sense that it's perfectly reasonable. In fact, it's probably the only way that we should really be growing our food where we can grow crops locally. Um, there is no earthly reason why they should go any further than they have to before they go from producer to consumer. And if the links are rebuilt between producers and consumers, as we now understand them, we can really put meaning into that wonderful understanding of Carlo Petrini and the slow food movement. But actually, as consumers, whether we be simply people who go to shops and buy products, or whether we be cooks and bakers and people who take primary raw materials and transform them for others. We should see ourselves as co-producers. In other words, our action in buying or using that food that comes out of the ground should be linked to the decisions made by the person putting the seeds in the ground. We are involved in that sense, engaged. And I would almost say engagé in the French sense, in, in that there is politics here, there is, um, there is power. And we need to collectively develop systems which will reward farmers, not on the basis of the yield that they make for their own individual um, economy, which obviously needs to make a profit to survive, but beyond that profitability needs to have some values attached to it as well. We should be asking our farmers to measure their success in terms of what we as co-producers and the, and the eaters, along with the farmers themselves, of course, of these products actually want, which is healthy food. And people are just beginning now to work out some serious ways of measuring the number of people nourished per hectare as an alternative metric from the number of hectares, the number of kilos or tons produced per hectare, which is how every farmer measures his yield at the moment. If we could get that kind of understanding really embedded in a local grain economy, then farmers could, could decide to grow grains which yielded slightly less, but which had each grain had more mineral density in, more vitamins in, and more likelihood to go down well when made into bread properly by bakers who are also connected in this process. So you get the general idea that if we can re-establish those links and have people kind of looking each other in the eye and saying, if you're going to grow something for me, I'd like you to make it as good as you possibly can, and please don't put any chemical rubbish on it, because I'd rather accept a certain loss in yield and therefore a little bit of an increase in price, perhaps, so that I don't have to eat residues of glyphosate, which you've been foisting on me for the last 40 years, which I now know is a potential or probable carcinogen according to the latest research. So, you know, that kind of conversation could happen in a way 
where it's much more likely to have resonance than when it is just a kind of academic discussion between policy makers. And if we look at the bread making method, it's important that that also doesn't waste the, the value, if you like, the integrity of the crop grown by the farmer. So it needs to be likely to produce the most consistent transmission of those nutrients through to the baked bread or whatever it is. And, and that, that should be as maximally accessible to the bodies of the people who are eating it. But also the context in which it's shared should, in my view, not just be a kind of rather anonymous exchange of money for goods that takes place in an anonymous kind of shed called a supermarket, where there's no real connection between, you know, the colorful packaging on the, on the product and what it really represents. In fact, much of that packaging is designed to disguise the way in which it's been made or what's in it and present it as something that it isn't. Sadly, something that bakers are all too good at doing by making their products look good uh, as opposed to being good. And so I, I think that only when the baker can um, engage with the person who is hoping to sell his, his goods to, one to one directly, can he be expected to, to, if you like, answer for its integrity and say, no, I haven't used any additives in there. It is the way it is, maybe a little bit less in volume this year because the harvest wasn't that good. And that involves us, that engages us with the reality of life for the farmer. We can't, we can't change the, the seasons and we can't change the variability of our climate. And so to pretend that we can by a little bit of chemistry or a little bit of, of this and that, as if it was our right as end users uh, to have something that, that was uh, consistent because it's possible to do that, as opposed to because, um, or despite the fact that it's not very good for us because it contains so many compromises. Now that, it seems to me, is uh, the benefit of closing those <coughs> supply chains down, making them shorter, and enabling people to, to feel some real sense of connection between the, uh, the producer and the rest of us as co co-producers. The Scotland the Bread has started by finding some of these older grains that were grown in the 19th century and examining them, doing no more than that. It's not a museum project. It's very much a forward-looking project to see whether there are some genes, some attributes to those grains that might be useful in um, mixtures or hybrids or populations that we might grow in the future but um, we aren't going to grow things just because they're old. Um, that would be um, nonsensical and wouldn't serve anybody in the long run other than the curators of seed banks. So what, we, what we're really trying to do is to, is to swing the whole thrust of research around so that everybody in the system is, is turning themselves not from creating marginal economic advantage for individual sectors farmers, millers, bakers, and so on, which involves a loss of value, but, but to get everybody aligned to conserve and maximize value through the system. And by value, I don't just mean economic value for individual businesses. I mean, which I take for granted as being necessary, the oil that keeps the machine going, but I mean real value for the end consumer. And the value is in that wonderful loaf of bread that we know is going to be super tasty, super digestible, and full of all the nutrients we need in a small number of slices so that we don't get programmed into overconsumption as we are with our hollowed out vacuous breads, which you seem to be able to eat an awful lot of without it really satisfying the body in any meaningful way. Now, um, I mentioned sourdough earlier on, and I could have given you a whole host of reasons why sourdough it seems to me, is the future of baking. This sounds desperately trendy, but of course sourdough is the way in which all bread was made until really quite recently in the greater scheme of things. So we're simply rediscovering something that we've always done and now have a clearer idea of why it is especially good that we do it. But unfortunately, the way of 
um, food companies and the food industry generally, is that when something, some understanding begins to emerge, which appears to have some real value, and sourdough bread clearly does, um, they have a nasty habit of trying to jump on a bandwagon. And some of you may have seen in supermarkets now sourdough breads appearing under surprising labels, not your favorite local artisan baker, but um, Mr. Tesco, if such a person exists, or Mr. Sainsbury. Of course, they don't. Um, and in their loaf telling salons, you may know them as in-store bakeries, but in the real bread campaign, we don't like to call them bakeries because nothing is baked there. Um, Pre-baked and frozen and part-baked breads are, are simply brought in and given, given a little tan in hot ovens there. So that's why we call them loaf tanning salons. Um, you see breads called sourdough, which actually um, more merit the description which I've assigned to them, which is pseudo, P-S-E-U-D-O-U-G-H, because they actually only contain deactivated dried sourdough powder in an otherwise unchanged recipe formulation with all the additives. Now, they, they can be called sourdough only because the law has nothing to say about sourdough. There is no definition of it. And so it's an it's, uh, open day on exploitation of this term. And if you can't sell your bread, and they don't appear to be able to sell their bread in its traditional form because sales are on a historical nosedive, then what better than to jump on the latest bandwagon, chuck in some um, a little bit of dried sourdough powder and then call your bread sourdough, charge a little bit less than you can get it from an artisan bakery. And of course, the predictable happens. People who have found that they can digest real sourdough bread see this rather bargain offer, can't resist the bargain, buy the bread and then blow up like a balloon and all the old symptoms come back. And unfortunately, um, the, the victim in this is often the sourdough process. People say, oh, well, it can't have been sourdough that was the problem because I've just eaten a sourdough bread and it's all gone wrong again. Now, that is really serious and could be... It's not only damaging, of course, to the, to the, the, the business done by, by artisan bakers who are making real sourdough, but it's actually potentially quite distressing to people who then are plunged into uncertainty as, what, as to what it is which, they, which is causing this digestive discomfort and what they should be eating. Satish Kumar, whose name, of course, resonates in these parts to a great extent, wrote a book called Soil, Soul and Society. And it seems to me that we perhaps ought to add another S to that trilogy. Soil, Soul, Sourdough and Society. Because I, I firmly believe that as as food, but also as metaphor, sourdough has everything about it. The interaction of yeasts and bacteria, which are at its heart, symbolize the right relationships, which seem to me to be what mindful baking is all about. And so, in relation to this rather pathetic attempt to, to jump on the bandwagon of um, sourdough, uh, there is a sort of uh, play on words that's obvious there, uh, not just my little joke about pseudo, but actually that in, in terms of, um, if you like, intellectual property, we have a notion in, in English law, that of passing off. When somebody does something which looks rather like somebody else's or steals somebody else's idea, pretends it's their own, and passes it off. For those of you who, for whom English is not their first language. This is an idiom which you may not have come across, but passing off is a, is a kind of um, actionable offence. Somebody can sue you for passing off their intellectual property as your own. It means, in a sense, pretending that it's your own. But of course, the essence of sourdough is the opposite of passing off. It's passing on. Because when you make sourdough, you don't just pass on a little bit of the culture from this batch to the next batch you make. But there's every incentive to pass on both the baked bread, but also the ability to make it in the form of the sourdough culture that you're sharing. So in conclusion, I would just like you to encourage, to encourage you to think about being agents of change by passing on 
sourdough and all the understandings about our food and how we should do it better and more mindfully, rather than getting anywhere near that passing off that is going on at the moment. And thereby, in your actions of mindful baking and passing on of good things, to change our food and our bread, and even, I think it's fair to say, our society, one loaf at a time. Thank you very much.